Okay. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to the Lola Waro special permit, special work session. Um, we will now consider it in session. Um, and I will, I guess, kick it off to Larry for a preview of what we, how we envision to, tonight going. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so tonight's meeting, um, and I, I just have to wait for a few minutes for the, uh, the attendees to, uh, to join into this, but um, the purpose of the meeting really is to sit down with the applicant and uh, have the board go through um, the application, their request, and uh, if there's questions that come up uh, the, from the board side or from the applicant side, it's an opportunity to discuss those uh, in a work session format. Um, if you give me uh, a couple seconds here, I'll uh, adjust the, uh, the panel here to, to bring the applicant in. Hold on. Okay. So Larry, then there's only two members of the public there so far? Yes. Okay. But everything's being recorded and streamed and all that. Okay. So, yep. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, welcome. Um, and uh, is anyone else of your, of your team coming or this is the three that are here? Yep, um, it's three of us tonight, myself, uh, William James, and also Erica Seaborn from uh, the law firm of Polsonelli, PC. Welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. Right, well, welcome. Hello. Hey Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. So, um, you know, what we'd like to do, uh, as I said in kind of the uh, introduction here, is to go through in a, a fairly methodical way the um, you know, some of the concerns that the board had, some of the questions they had, some of the issues, and, uh, and go through, uh, you know, in an organized way, those questions. And so Marianne has a list that we've put together ourselves just to help guide us through this. And uh, if the board has questions, you know, this is, this is an open work session for us to, to work on these issues, work on these questions. So um, why don't we get started, Marianne? Yeah, um, just to say, so, not, not all of these are open issues. Some of them, you know, have already been settled, you've given us the information, whatever, but it's just, just, just so we've got everything on the table. Now, Jennifer, you got a copy of it. Did you forward it to Erica and, and, and William? I did, yes, okay. I did get a copy and I appreciate you preparing that outline. I think it's gonna be helpful for, yeah. you know, structured kind of discussion. Um, and we do appreciate very much the board um, suggesting that we have this work session. I think this will be a helpful and productive um, exercise. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so, so um, it's, uh, the, the first thing are, um, are just the requirements, I think that the board um, had stated um, and they would be for all programs um, and events. Then we'll get down to specifics about the different things you're doing. Um, and the, the first one, um, is um, that there wouldn't be any parking, including buses on Broadway, Fargo, or other village streets. Sure. I imagine everyone's okay with that. Do you want to hear from the board first, Marianne? No, then... no, no. We'd, we'd let's, as we get to the issue, but uh, yeah, if you've got something to say on that, yeah, I think sure. now's okay. a good time. Yeah, so generally, I, I think that that's fine. You know, we, we don't intend to, um, to use uh, Broadway, Fargo, or other village streets uh, for parking. Uh, we intend to, um, you know, in the program materials to direct people to park elsewhere. Um, obviously, you know, we can um, advertise the fact that there's no parking on Broadway, no parking on Fargo, um, or other village streets. Ultimately, the, the folks attending the programs, you know, we we, we're not gonna be there in the vehicles with them as they're approaching the site. Um, so there may be um, occasional attendees that, that park on a village street um, where there's obviously parking permitted by code. Um, uh, so we would hope that there's some flexibility there and, and understanding and recognition that we can't control um, you know, all, all uh, program attendees. 
Um, but certainly it's it's not our intention to have any parking on Broadway, Fargo or other streets. Um, we do, I think we mentioned at the last meeting, um, and I know this is jumping ahead a little bit, the transportation from the offsite parking locations to the site, back and forth from the offsite location to this site. Uh, we intend to use a, a jitney service, not the big coach buses on a regular basis. So the jitney, the intent is for the jitney to um, access the driveway. Um, there is a little bit of a, a pinch point there on the right side of the driveway access, um, but we do intend to have the jitney utilize the driveway to let passengers off and, 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 and have them uh, load onto the jitney. Um, there may, we mentioned at the last meeting, there may be times when a coach bus is utilized if there's a large group coming, for example, from the city, um, a coach bus cannot get into that driveway. Um, so the coach bus would have to temporarily park on Broadway to let passengers off and, and have them um, you know, board the, the, the bus at the end of the program. Um, we think that's gonna be uh, that that won't be our, a regular occurrence. It'll be temporary, um, about 30-ish minutes. Um, and in that case, we would, you know, utilize any traffic control measures the village would direct us uh, to as far as off-duty off police officers or any other um, traffic control measures you feel are necessary in that case. Why would it take 30 minutes to unload a bus? That's what, what I was I was told is sort of the, the average time to for the, the passengers to get on and off the bus. It, it could be less. It, it could be less. Wh whatever the amount of time is. The other option is to take the bus and unload it in one of the parking lots and use a jitney. Yeah. Which yeah. I don't definitely. think we can have coaches stopping on Broadway at any no. time for any length of time. That's just not going to work. It's too busy of a roadway. It's too much of a main arterial link. And that's what the offsite parking is supposed to help manage. I, I completely agree with Mark's point there. It takes also having recently been to a couple of weddings where there was coach transport back to the hotels, oh, it takes okay. longer to load people back onto the buses after a happy event than to unload them at the beginning. Mm -hmm. so, yes. you know, well, I, Jennifer, I, I, I'm, I'm very aware that you're using the word intend. It's not our intention. But we want to be real clear here. We're we're not talking about just intentions. We want there to be a very specific commitment to what will and will not happen as you as you plan for these particular kinds of events. So right. I, I I thought the same thing that Mark mentioned that a, a a bus would use an offsite parking and then people would get in the jitney and go into the driveway, thus avoiding exactly what Janice is talking about. Um, avoiding any kind of congestion on already congested uh, Broadway. And I also wondered about the people that you mentioned who might come um, and park on a street. I think we talked a bit last time about anybody who's a registered uh, guest to an event would get information about the specific parking place that they're assigned <laughs> on the property or a specific uh, direction about going to the offsite place. And that with a procedure like that in place, um, I can't imagine it happening that somebody would do an alternative and simply, you know, just park. But I agree uh, with you completely. And that's what we, that's, yeah. that's the procedure that we're going to use. Um, and and, and I, I agree with you that it's, it's unlikely that someone's not going to park as instructed um but you know people do things that they're not supposed to do <laughs> yeah but um, i assume occasion. jennifer but you can include on your your invitation or your instructions to getting to it you know in capital letters or bold letters or something you know no parking on village streets i mean i think you can you know take some steps to um um you know you can't guarantee it but take steps to you know as much as possible, keep it from happening. Absolutely, and as I mentioned, that that's what the plan is to to take those steps in the registration process to make sure that the participants understand where they are supposed to park and where they're not supposed to park. It's got to be proactively monitored and and you know midstream corrected 
between events because after all, this stuff is working under the basic special permit for the educational function. And the special permit can be revoked if there's a pattern of non-compliance with the various directives within it. So it's definitely, I'm, much, I'm just emphasizing what some other people have said, it's a much more proactive approach has to be taken on, your, on the part of the organization. It can't be just kind of, well, we tried. Mm -hmm. and because the way, that, without being redundant, you would agree that, that as part of the special permit, the wording, you know, you would agree to wording that says you will include that information about no parking in your communications and um, the other points being brought up in terms of, of jitney use and, and, and lack of backup on Broadway as part of the permit being issued. Yes, that, that's included in our proposal. So we, we would not have an objection to that. Um, I also wanna mention the idea about having the coach bus go to the offsite parking location and then have passengers go from the offsite parking to the site. That's not um, something that we had previously considered, but um, it's certainly something that we can discuss with the client. Um, it's just not something that had co has come up in either our discussions with the board or um, amongst the team, but it's, it's, um, a, it's a valid point and something you that we can absolutely consider. You don't have very much else to do. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna keep coach buses from stopping on Broadway and you're not gonna tear down the walls and open the gates up to get them on the property, then you really don't have much of an option. You either don't use coach buses or you use them off site. So it's not a discussion. So it's not like it's it. open for negotiation, I think. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not a, yeah, it's the, not the, a negotiation point. It's a public safety issue. I appreciate that. And we're, tr we're trying to, to work cooperatively with the board and you know, we're, we're we're trying to be collaborative here and-, and Well, we this is not a collaborative it. thing. This is an absolute requirement. <laughs> and, and Jennifer is yeah. the representative- Excuse of me, I thought the purpose of this meeting was for collaboration to not figure everything out was collaborative. what we need to do. And so I don't understand why there's a presumption that we are going to intentionally do things to, to harm the city or to bother the residents. Like, we're trying to figure this out, and Jennifer just said, "No, to Erica, me, I don't think that considered that we will now." Erica, I don't think that's what anybody's getting yet. They're just saying it that not not that there are other things that may well be negotiable, but it, it's the board has been very firm about this all along. We don't want buses stopped on Broadway. The village can't handle it, and we've just said that we will go back to the client and tell them that. Okay, that's all. That was that was the point that Mark meant was non-negotiable, and I think everybody on the board agrees to that. So, so let's go. Let's go to number three, which is related. It's almost the same thing, and I think we'll be off that right away. If offsite parking is used for any event, a regular special um, drop-off has to be on site, and obviously you recognize that because that's what Jennifer was saying with, with the jitney. Okay, then number two, and Connie touched on this. Um, for all programs, tours, and other events, the on-site parking spaces must be designated for specific vehicles. Um, so that if you were gonna have, you know, anything that would have more than, I, you know, like 12, car, you know, 12 cars coming, I think that's the number of spaces you have, right? 12 or whatever, or maybe you have some more with, 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 the, um, before, with, the, um, with the valet, whatever that number is. Let, let's, let's say it could be, you know, 18 cars. That you have, the others have to be given, those have to, the, the only people who can park in those spaces have to have like a permit to park in those spaces. Um, because what we can have is, People, you know, so you hand out, you know, let's say it's 18, you hand out 18 for 18 cars, and then you you, you don't you don't want somebody else in 19 or 20 or 21 coming and thinking, you know, maybe we can get a parking space. So if you don't have a parking pass, you've got to park at one of the offsite places. Right. Otherwise, yeah. you're gonna have, you know, is that something you can agree to? I, I believe it is that um, we discussed this with the client earlier today, um, a, a process by which, you know, folks that are going to be permitted to park on site 
would know that prior to, to being on site. Um, it's sort of similar to the, the process we just talked about, the registration okay. process. Okay. Um, folks will be notified of where they're, they're supposed to be parking, um, okay. whether that's a designated on-site location or at the off-site location. Okay. And there was a mention of Ubers last time of possibly arranging Uber transport for people to avoid off-site parking. Just that had come up last time, but just anything that creatively avoids the, the, the parking crunch would be. Right, absolutely. And we talked, um, or on a, we had a call earlier this afternoon and, and also talked about the fact that, um, you know, public transportation is available as well, use of the, the train station um, and either, you know, Ubering from the train station or carpooling from the train station up to the offsite location. So there's, there's a couple different options. Um, and, you know, I, I visited the site yesterday um, again, and it, it occurred to me how close the offsite parking locations are and the fact that some folks may even just choose to walk. You know, it's, it's really not <laughs> a very difficult walk from the offsite parking location to- It's very flat to, as well, which is good. It's flat, flat and, and it's pretty. And, system. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great walk, so. And actually, you know, uh, Jennifer and, and William knows this, uh, you know, you can walk from the, from the train too. It's a, yeah. It's a great little walk. You can stop for coffee on the way up. And that one's not flat, it. though. No, no, that's the beauty of it for everybody. Get your exercise. Stay in shape. It's easier on the way back. It's downhill. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so okay. I think there's a lot of options. Okay, good. So we're okay on that. And then, and then the last one um, of on the general requirements. And we talked a little bit about this last time. I think there might have been a little bit of disagreement, but I think the board all agrees that they don't want any amplified music or sound. So I, I, we had a question about this um, because for the programs um, at Villa Luaro for the Institute, you know, there's a possibility that the, the, the faculty, the lecturers may need to use a microphone um, as part of the well, program. Well, they're inside, so right? In, Not right. necessarily. That, that could be inside, it could be an, an outdoor lecture, um, but we just want to make sure that we understand um, the scope of what's meant by no amplification of music or sound, because yeah. it may interfere with, with how some of the programs are structured. Uh. <laughs> you know, I'm less worried about the sound during events like that, I think the biggest problem is as it gets later into the evening, what would be more like party music is I think what neighbors are were complaining about. So I don't I don't see the lecture issue during the day as if I'm assuming they're during the day. There could be some at night, but it doesn't seem to be as big of an issue as maybe the um, you know, the after party type of stuff. Well, well, you could me, specify me, like, you know, no amplification of music or sound other than microphones for, you know, speakers, speakers, you know, program speakers or something like that. There may be occasions where there is music played. And I will say, for an example, the earlier event, which everyone is referencing, on both days, the music ended at six o'clock on Thursday. And on Saturday, it was finished by 6.45. So it did not run into the night. It, it was still daylight, especially during the summertime. So we did not disturb anyone into the late evening. Right, but you are talking about at, at the Institute events, about having after lecture, either cocktail hours or things of that nature in the evening. At least that's the way I... I read that presentation. I think that's the concern at the board. A, I don't think we're, we're looking to limit, you know, as I said, you know, in, you know, certainly not indoor, but even, you know, if it's an outdoor lecture presentation, I don't think we're looking to limit that. I think the concern is if there are going to be, you know, 15, you know, meetings a year from one to three days. And if even the majority of those have after hour outdoor activities as social events, uh, that that I think is the concern that we have. As I recall, one of the neighbors talked about what she described as the cocktail party that went on for quite a while. And it seemed that um, she was concerned about how much noise 
that creates. Well, now that was more people maybe than would be the total number. So, but, you know, just to know that, um, you know, uh, I don't know, I, 50 people well, talking outside um, could, could be pretty loud as a party, even though it's not music. So I just, I don't know, it's, it's so, really a sensitivity issue and we need to work through how to make that, um, you know, really uh, palatable to the neighbors. We, we are sensitive to that. Um, the neighbor who mentioned that was actually at the event both days and can attest that the music was done by 645. Yeah. Now, is the village proposing that when we have events, we can have our guests talk outside i mean we can't control Talking that outside we, isn't I, I, don't, I don't think that's it i think it's and i even to me like if you had like uh you know uh, a guitar that's not amplified or violins or whatever like to me that or a harp you know that kind of stuff to me isn't it's the the quote unquote you know glass rattling bass drum kind of stuff that they were talking that, that that the complaints are and you know and i think people talking after an event um, you know, especially if, you know, I can't imagine people are going to talk about late after. anyway. So I, I, that's not what I'm concerned about. It's more of the, you know, very loud amplified music, really. For yeah, me. but talking is an amplification, you know, William. Right. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't say no sound, you know, no amplified sound. It, people can talk. And like Brian said, you can have, you know, chamber music group or whatever, um, or, or or not necessarily chamber music, just a, a trio or something that's not amplified. Um, so, so is so there, is if if we have music, is there a time that if we do have to have some amplified music, and I don't even know if this is the case, I just want a clear understanding going forward. If we have amplified music, is there a time that the village is amenable to, similar to what we did at the, that occurred at the first two events, which were done by 645? I, I think that there's, I think there's two pieces of it. I think there's the absolute amount of volume. And it, I don't think, I think people were complaining if it was at noon or at five o'clock or midnight, it was just too loud by their standards for a neighbor, like a, a residential neighborhood. Um, we have a similar issue with a, uh, there's actually an event space down on the river. And when they have amplified sound, um, you know, if it's doesn't, I get, I get the phone calls if it's seven o'clock at night or, or midnight, they're, they're just, they're just more frequent when they're at 1030 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, so I think it's more just the, you know, overall, you know, thump of, a mu of music, you know, and I think that there's, there probably is a happy medium, but I think, you know, for the kind of base start, I think it's easier to say kind of, you know, eliminate amplified music outside, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a, a time people were thinking of that were, you know, from noon to five or noon to seven or something like that. Um, or if it's just easier in the beginning to say. Well, how about, how about handling it this way? That um, um, if it, if it were, um, I imagine the kind of things you're talking about would be related to the special events you know, your general event. It could be, it could also be part of a, a, a networking, um, you know, at the end of a program, um, having a networking reception for the participants of the program and having some light music being played either uh, within the dining room um, on the site or on the patio. Well, within the dining room is not an issue. We're talking about outside. And if you have light music, it's not, it wouldn't be amplified. Well, right? you're you saying that, Anything well, is the, anything play anything that's not an, an actual person playing music live would be amplified. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're playing, oh, so you're you know, talking on about a, music your on a iPhone out of a speaker, you know, that's okay. Okay. that's amplification. Yeah, that so is, that yeah. that's our concern that even if we want to play, I'm I'm dating myself a CD <laughs> or um, um, you know or you know, music from a from a, a smartphone or something um, out of a speaker at a reasonable volume um, that that would be under this provision that would be precluded. Um, I appreciate that that volume is an issue. Absolutely, we we, we wouldn't want to uh, project that music to a point that it's going to be a nuisance to the neighbors. Um, it would be a, a frankly a code violation to do so anyway, uh, regardless of the time. Um, but to have, you know, reasonably um, a reasonable volume of music playing 
uh, for a couple of couple hours mm -hmm. as part of a networking reception. But we're we're hoping that we can find a way to to creatively craft a condition that would allow that to happen um, without the uh, nuisances to the neighbors. Yeah, to me, if it's like if it's you know can't be heard beyond the you know kind of the uh, the property line, you know, like it's we kind of like a, like when I play music in my backyard, you can't really hear it from the street, you know, like that to me is not an issue. Um, right. it, it's really, if it kind of, you know, leaves the property, uh, for lack of a better term, um, you know, and I think, I think all we can think of is the, is the, the, you know, the, the, the two day of, of events that were, it was obviously very loud, especially after the, um, the show. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think that common sense is, is, you know, maybe going out the window a little bit here, because, you know, as you say, if you have a, a Bluetooth speaker with some music while people are hanging out in the backyard, I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with that. So it's just how to get that Marianne um, codified, you know. And Maybe I, I'm there's some. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say I know that your your code doesn't necessarily include um, decibel levels uh, for its its noise regulation. Um, but maybe there's, you know, there's a way that we can come up with a reasonable decibel level at the property line um, as a way to to regulate that sound. We've tried uh, the decibel issues. Brian and uh, Janice and others can speak to that, trying to um, measure it and write it into a code. Um, you know, one of the issues is that bass does bass actually has a different, it doesn't really show up on the decibel level so much. It can actually, you can see, you know, glass shaking and it's not loud. It's like a weird, um, I, I'm not, I don't know enough. I'm not a sound engineer, so I can't really speak to it. Although we, we've tried to do it before in practice. Um, Larry, did you have an idea of a practical way to do this? Well, no, no. The, 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 listen, I, I, we can't get into, my, my opinion is we can't get into decibel uh, discussions here. We tried to have that uh, completely separate from this application and we haven't arrived at an answer. So I wouldn't suspect we're going to arrive at an answer just for this application. I mean, I do go back to the, to the existing nuisance code, which is very um, subjective, but it may be, it may be something that we can work with here to at least refer back to it. I mean, it, it, the, the language that's in here is talks about, you know, using, um, Per permitting um, musical instrument or phonograph or any device uh, in such a manner as to disturb the peace, quiet, and comfort of the neighboring inhabitants. That's obviously very subjective. Uh, or at any time with louder volume than is necessary for convenient hearing for the person or persons who are voluntary listeners there too. Okay. And while you might say, well, what does that mean? You know. Yeah, it's not very precise, but on the other hand, it, it kind of kind of gets at what we're talking about here. You know, the, the Bluetooth speaker is, you know, no louder than is necessary for the people around it to hear it. So that doesn't mean there's no sound, but it means that it's 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 at an appropriate level. On the other hand, if it's blasting, you know, exceptionally loud so that the entire, you know, quarter square mile can hear it. That's obviously louder than necessary for the people around it. I mean, I, I think you're right. Yeah. I like the approach of using the existing code in this instance, rather than trying to overlay yet a different requirement in terms of sound. What you're reading sounds pretty reasonable. And if neighbors are having a problem, they can complain and the police can come and visit and say, you know, we recommend you turn your sound down a little bit because the neighbors are complaining. Um, that seems like a much more friendly resolution than to get out there and have to deal with the, you know, decibel readings and- Where this seems, them from. seems more neighborly and residential as well. So I think that, that that's probably the best way to go forward, I think, because saying no, no amplified music at all is kind of ridiculous because if you play off your iPhone, that's technically, you know, amplified. It can be. It can be loud. Yeah, because even yesterday when I was um, at the property, if you're on the back terrace, um, the house behind us, if the kids are in the pool and they're playing music by the pool, I can hear it on the terrace and I can hear yeah. people walking by on the aqueduct. So it's, I mean, any level of sound is going to carry in that space. I just think we should come to a compromise that's reasonable for everyone. Yeah, well, as it's written, I do think that the 
current nuisance law is fairly reasonable. You know, it's everything's judgmental and people do overreact sometimes, but it has worked in the past. I don't know. The only thing I'd be concerned about is just making sure that we have an enforcement on um, a cutoff time so it doesn't become late night noise because I think that works against you as an organization. And we are being able to that. We are Absolutely. I, I think the code, if I if I recall correctly, when I looked at it um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I think it sets midnight, actually, as, the, <laughs> yeah, right. as level, which is far too late. I mean, no, we, that's we not absolutely. really the limit. That was yes. just, you know, uh, you prima facie you violate the code. Sure. It, it may but, well be earlier than that. But you can. Yeah. Still, what I'm yeah, saying you, is we'd be happy still... to agree to something earlier than than midnight. So, what, what's it? What's it? I mean, like. 9 p.m. Eight, eight, well, I was going to say eight. I mean, if people are complaining their kids go to bed, wouldn't eight cover you for your, you know, your your after program um, outdoor gatherings? I think it would. And I don't know if it makes sense to make a distinction between weekdays and weekends, maybe 8 p.m. during the weekdays and, and 9 or 10 o'clock, um, you know, with a little bit of extra time on the weekends. I think that we have to look at it from a school perspective. So yeah. Friday, it would be Friday and Saturday would be the virtual. Friday, Saturday. And then yeah. Sunday through Thursday would be the school day. Correct. That makes sense. What's the time on that? Everyone? I thought we would eight on school days and nine or 10, whatever we'd come to conclude here on weekends. Someone want to take a straw? I, you, I assume the applicants ask Remember, you not, you know, not everybody who lives around here has kids of school age. There's going to be people with, with young children who go to bed much earlier. I'm not saying you should make it earlier than 8 o'clock, but you make it 10 o'clock and you're trying to get your baby to sleep. I mean, and also, it seems to me that the sort of events that you're talking about that might have this music, um, would they would they be running that late? These, you know, d dinners after the seminar or whatever. It's a possibility on the weekend that if we have a, a evening seminar beginning at five or six o'clock, by the time we have the seminar dinner in a and after hour, yeah, it may run past eight o'clock. Well, I, I would certainly say nine would be the, I, I wouldn't go to 10 um, myself. Remember that we still have the overriding standard of unnecessarily loud. Right. I'm, I'm not saying that changes yeah. anything, but that, that kind of is the umbrella over everything. Yeah, I think it's, um, so if you said eight um, on what we're, what we're uh, familiar with. Yeah, eight, but college. eight at school nights, nine otherwise. Okay, let's, let's work with that. I mean, I won't say school nights up. <laughs> right, the that's nights. Like, it's the new legal language. Oh, no, no school today, it's a day off, yeah. Uh, okay. Columbus Day. <laughs> All right, actually, I think those were some of the harder issues. Now we're going to some easier stuff. We, okay. Before oh. before we move on, so we we are at nine o'clock. No amplified sound outside on the uh, Fridays and Saturday nights. Yep. Are you going to have that much regular programming on the weekends, or is that no, more I'm, likely to be your special events? It it could be it could be both. I just I just want to be clear when we say no that there, there are going to be occasions that it may be a seminar that's on a weekend. You got to remember, this is a, a nonprofit organization. So a lot of these um, companies or um, people that we are assisting, they have, you know, full-time jobs, they have businesses that they're running. So there may be occasion where things are in an afternoon or a weekend so that we can fit, fit it into their schedule as well. Yeah, but again, that's where it becomes more problematic about doing it in, you know, in a neighborhood. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not what would happen. I just want to say that there is a possibility. 
Sure. Okay. I guess I'm not comfortable with cutting it off at nine o'clock. I think that's a little bit too extreme. We already have the noise ordinance to override everything, but. Yeah, I, I mean, at nine or 10, I mean, to me, 10 o'clock is, if you're putting a little baby to sleep, nine o'clock doesn't help more than 10 o'clock. And I think for most people, 10 o'clock is probably not objectionable, so. I would go with that just because I think if it really is, weekends tend to be, you know, they do tend to be, um, I don't know. I don't want to call them uh, more formal, but you know, uh, late afternoon, evening, and you know, you don't want to cut things off totally at the, you know, at the knees. A quick straw poll. I stay nine, but I go to bed really early. I get up really early. So. Okay, so Larry Lonky, nine or ten. I would go till ten o'clock on the weekends. And G okay, so then Janice, ten o'clock on the weekend. Okay, so we're ten. Okay. Babies have got to. You have to stay up later, Connie. Oh. <laughs> uh, but four in the right. morning, you can get a lot done. I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I, I mean I I get up early, but I also go to bed late. So, um, okay, office. Okay, let, so so then the, the the first use, the easiest use, is the office and administration. It would be just helpful to know what the maximum number of employees are gonna be there at one time. I, th I think you might have um, uh, talked about that in your application, that and, and the days and hours of operation. I, I think that could have been in your um, uh, statement of use. Or we did talk about the fact that currently there's three members on the board of directors of the Institute. Um, uh, and there's a caretaker uh, that comes to the site uh, every other day or so uh, for security purposes and maintenance purposes. Um, and then there's um, a couple of admin professionals um, you know, that, that the Institute contracts with. Um, we anticipate that you know, the, the office setting here is not gonna be your traditional Monday through Friday, nine to five, right? So um, the board, what would typically be uh, what would typically happen is the board of directors would have a meeting um, at Villa Luaro. So you'd have the three board of directors, uh, possibly their assistants, um, uh, administrative professional. Um, so I think if you're looking at the maximum, of, and then of course, if it's a luncheon meeting, you know, there, there might be someone there to help cater and clean up, right? So I think if you're looking for the maximum number of um, of, of people that could be utilizing the office space at any given time, including caterer, custodial staff. Um, I think 12 is probably um, a, a fair estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, it's not, it, I'm sorry. That, that seems like a very reasonable that, number to that, me. Right, right. That's yeah. And it, it's not going to be every day. Um, uh, it's six to eight days per month is what we're estimating. Um, some of the meetings may be in the evening, as as William mentioned. You know, it is a nonprofit, um, so um, some members of the board of directors do have other jobs <laughs> that take up their time during the the regular working hours. So some of the meetings may occur in the evening uh, for dinner, um, but six to eight days a month. Um, and about 12 would, would likely be the maximum. And again, okay. your on-site parking would be able to, to handle all of the, that capacity. Uh, That's true. You know, and again, we would just would ask that not everyone arrive at exactly the same time. So there's a line to get into the parking area. Right. Um, you know, and that's the idea of sort of giving passes and, or, you know, just talking ahead of time about getting people in and out. Right. I'm thinking about so, catering for a second. I, I'm wondering if that's an issue with, you know, a lot of times catering the foods brought in kind of, you know, in racks and things and then heated or final prep on site. So I'm assuming that all happens at a less busy time of day. Yep. And there are kitchen facilities um, at the site as well. So I, this is probably not, I, I, I don't, I think, I think this was to try to get some idea of what's going to, you know, be occupying the space like a lot more, but I, I don't see any, any condition probably having to relate to this since it seems to be well within the limits. Does the board agree? I agree. Yeah. Okay. 
Let me make a note, no conditions necessary. Okay. Is the carriage, just as an aside, is the carriage house used for this as well as the main house? I'll let William or, or Erica field that one. The, the carriage house primarily uh, will be used probably for the catering in the in the prep and the meetings will take place in the main house. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so then let's move on to the seminars, workshops, and meetings. Um, and, you know, give the board an you know, idea of the total number of programs per month, the days, the hours of each. I know you gave us a range, but, um, um, and then the, the reason I have question three, will attendees be known in advance of the program? Um, that relates because... I mean, we don't care who's there, but it, but it relates to the assigned parking spaces, you know, um, and then um, and how you expect them to get to and from 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 Villa Luaro, um, and then the the maximum number of uh, attendees that, that that are on site at the program, including all the administrative and and custodial staff. And I I think there was some discussion of a cap of fifty. Um, and um, so maybe you guys want to res respond to that. I think those are the, the things the board um, was con concerned about and then um, see how you respond to that. Sure, so the easiest one first, absolutely. The attendees will be known in advance of the program. This is um, you know, a, an organization that has been holding these programs uh, for some time that's run by professional staff. It's not a you know, walk-in only kind of, um, yeah. kind of event. So, so it's um, not, we're having this event and, you know, you come know, one, come all. no, it's a right. it's okay. registrants okay. that have to yeah register in advance uh -huh. of the program. Um, yeah. So all attendees will be known and we'll be able to um, include any, you know, uh, relevant instructions for, for attendance um, as part of that registration process. Okay. Um, so as far as the, the number of programs per month and the days and the hours um, in our statement of use in our materials, we had um, said it would be two to four programs per quarter. Um, so eight to 16 per year. I, I see here you, you're asking for a total number of programs per month. Um, if we're looking at a maximum per month, I would say probably two per month. Um, uh -huh. so if we say one per month, it's going to come below the, the yeah. essentially eight to 16 per year. Um, so two per month, um, more likely one per month. But um, like I said, uh -huh. we, if you're looking for a maximum. Okay, yeah, two, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we need to, to know by month just to get an idea. Yeah. Of it. And yeah, if I looked, just to remind everybody what the statement of use says, it's estimated um, the Institute will host approximately two to four of such programs per quarter, which would be eight to 16 a year. Programs will last for one to three days per occurrence and attendance will range from approximately 25 to 50 participants. Full day programming typically takes place between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. with evening dinners and or networking receptions following the formal program. Um, during such programming, select attendees may stay overnight at the property. Well, you know, assuming that, you know, you got to building department. Now, is the, is the board comfortable with, with, with do, do you need to know more than that? I'd like to get an idea, you know, again, what, when, uh, what, what type of ancillary personnel, I'm just trying to get an idea, um, you know, again, when, when we issue this permit and that you know particularly for for this use the seminar use we don't we're not going to keep track of every one of these events when they happen and as they happen and and you know i think my greatest concern is the total number of people that will be coming in and out of the place per per event and at 50 participants what what other personnel you know how high is the number going to be um or do we want to in some way limit the participant or just limit the total number of people that are at the venue 
for any individual use, because again, we don't want you to have to come in front of us every time you're gonna have a seminar event. We want these seminar events to be you know, organized and to run and not that we don't wanna be part of it, but we don't wanna know everyone and get phone calls about everyone. So if we, you know, in my mind, you know, this is something that if we can, you know, come to an agreement on that, you know, this would allow it to move very smoothly and a lot easier. So again, I guess my question is, you know, in addition to the participants, what's the number of other people that would be there, you know, in terms of instructors, in terms of caterers, are participants bringing significant others or, or other invitees or things of that nature? Because 50 can easily become 100, uh, you know, in those situations. Yep, so we had a chance to talk about this earlier today. Um, and um, as stated in the application materials, the 25 to 50 participants, those would be the number of people actually participating in the program, the, the registrants, uh, the people coming to the site for the, the educational opportunity. Um, on top of that, we estimated that there would be approximately 10 to 12 staff people, you know, staff persons on site, including the faculty, um, uh, folks to help clean up, um, folks to help ad uh, administer the, the registration process, administrative, um, uh, administrative staff. Um, so 10 to 12 is, is about the range of sort of support staff, including the faculty that, that's estimated for the programming. And then do you expect um, for the evening program, might, might their spouses or significant others be invited or did you have that in mind or? I don't think that, that that's typical. Um, okay. I think usually when you would have more than one sort of attendee is if they represent a company that for example, has two founders or three founders, but no, it's usually just the representative from the company that, um, you know, is getting the training and it's just them. It's not their family or anybody else. So, so 50 becomes 60 to 62 to 65 on the high end. On the high end. Yeah. And, um, as we were speaking earlier today, you know, it was noted that that 50 would would be on the high end. It, it's more likely that most of the programs would be more in the the you know the third 25, 30, 25 to 35. Right. Uh, because I, I think the range. A point that should be made here is that on-site programming is really going to be um, tailored for very specific um, individuals and topics because our programming is national, we're not flying everyone in for every um, you know, thing that we have. Most of it is virtual. Um, so when we have people coming on site, it will be you know, fairly special, um, a fairly high caliber level of uh, participant in our overall programming. And again, I think this is great. This is the part of the whole program that, that, that I think is, you know, is, is unique and exciting and I really want to see it happen. Um, but again, you know, it, it's one thing to say that 50 is the high end, but once we allow 50, then every event could become 50. Uh, and then we're talking about 60 or more people total. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more if we made it 25 to 40 and that would top off at, at uh, 50 to perhaps 55 maximum, or if we just said a, a maximum number of, of, of people that are of, that can be be present at any event and let uh, and let the Institute determine how they want the numbers of people to fall. And again, Mike, I'm not trying to limit this. I really want this to happen. Um, but again, I want it to happen in a way that we're, we're comfortable issuing this permit and allowing it to go on without a, a lot of oversight. So one of the I'm things not sure that, how the rest of the board feels. I'm just voicing my opinion. And if it would be helpful, um, we I, was, I meant to mention this at the top of the meeting. Um, we'd love to extend an invitation to the board members to come to the site for those. I don't know how many of you have have been inside um, 
Kilaluaro uh, to see the layout and see sort of it's it's grander <laughs> grandeur. Um, but we'd be happy to you know work out a, a site visit, a date for a site visit um, for everybody to come see and 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 and, and understand that there's there's enough room <laughs> for for the 50 participants uh, to, to comfortably be located. Yeah, I, yeah um, Jennifer, I don't think that's the concern. The concern is the cars coming and going. And the part in the parking because you, you don't and, have or the jitneys places. coming and going. You know, the more people, the more coming and going. I, I don't think there's a concern that, that they'll fit, you know. Yeah, I'm just not, I guess, is it going to make an appreciable difference, um, you know, 10 or 15 additional people on the site to allow the, the, um, the maximum participants for these, these programs to be at 50? Is, is there going to be that much of a difference between that, that additional, you know, 10 people attending the program um, to, to warrant limiting us to less than the 50 maximum participants, um, which could kind of, you know, curtail uh, the programming um, opportunities that we may have at the site. I think it would be very helpful to understand how you would accommodate parking for that. I think that's the main focus because you don't have enough parking spaces. So you can't have each individual drive to the site. So if you maybe, can go through a little bit of the logistics of that. I imagine you've talked about it. How would that actually work? Yep. So um, as we talked about the, the register through the registration process, um, the registrants would be educated about where they can and cannot park um, at a, um, at a for, really for most of the programs, unless it's a very small program of only, you know, eight or 10 people, um, we anticipate using the, the offsite location. So, uh, registrants would be directed to that off-site parking location. Um, they would also be advised that, that um, public transportation is available as well um, at the, the local train station. Um, and there would be a jitney uh, bus, the, not a large coach bus, but the smaller jitney bus available to take um, those off-site parkers <laughs> um, from the off-site parking location to Villa Luaro they'll be um, uh, let off of the jitney uh, in the driveway um, and then picked up at the end of the, the program and brought back to their car. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I'm trying to get my head around imagining myself a neighbor. Um, I'd love to be, I'd, I'd love to have you next door to me, but um, I, I'm thinking what would I, how would I feel the difference if the maximum number of people coming um, twice a month was 50 or 62? I, I don't know. I, I, I think I feel a little more comfortable maybe if I knew that there was never more than 50 people, maybe that in my head would, um, would be more comfortable, but um, you know, it's hard, it's hard for me to you know, judge how much more confusion, possible noise um, I mean, issues I, that happen, the more people that are there. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're saying it would be quite a constraint on you if, if, if our board said the total number of people was 50. Is that difficult for, for you guys? I think the problem is, yeah, this is, this is the Institute's purpose <laughs> this yeah, is its bread and butter question. this is really the heart and soul of the special permit um so you know i think we're just a little hesitant on placing limitations on the opportunities for people to participate in the program i think that's 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 what you're hearing i think the, my view of this is if we have you know 10 or 15 staff they're probably going to come earlier in the day um you know and they're <laughs> not going to you know, be part of the, the rush for when the programming starts. So to me, you know, as long as it's not, you know, another 50 people that are going to be performing or something, um, you know, kind of it's, it shouldn't be an issue. So, you know, I also think that if you have 50 people parked off site, um, you know, at say the, the one of the churches, you know, again, uh, these are most most entrepreneurs are typically young, so they could probably walk also. So I don't I actually envision that not being that big of an issue. I think, again, it's it's just 
it's going to be how it's managed. And I think that that's going to be, you know, the important part. Um, and I, I think Larry's right. Larry Lonky's right. Where, you know, this is going to be one of those things where we're just going to okay it or not. And then it's going to be run, run its own course mostly or until we have a year, you know, a review a year later. So I think that, I think it's pretty clear what our concerns are. And um, I'm actually fairly confident you can manage these because I think, as you said, it is your bread and butter. This is what, when Rich spoke, you know, whatever it is, three years ago now, this was the exact programming that I was envisioning. You know, the, the 50 young women entrepreneurs coming to learn from, you know, a handful of, of successful business people um, and then having a great reception afterwards or something and, and, you know, reveling in the history of the building, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I actually... I think that, you know, 50 is probably not a bad number of participants and, you know, 10 to 15 staff members that, you know, it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not. She said 10 to 12. So no, she did. Don't stop it. (laughs) it. When the the caterer brings two extra people, you never know. So, uh, but, um, but, you know, to me, that's, I think, I think it's manageable because I think, again, I I can't imagine that the staff, you know, that people are going to be working on the event, probably going to get there earlier. So, you know, I think a lot of the logistics can be worked out. Um, you know, and, and not be too impactful. And, you know, seeing, seeing a bunch of young women entrepreneurs walking down Broadway, uh, to me, can be kind of um, inspiring in itself, too. And, then, you know, to me, so I, I actually hope I'm looking forward to that day when that happens. And, and I, th- I don't think it's going to be a traffic impact. So. Okay. Well, yeah, Janice and Mark should weigh in. I agree. I, I, the point the point I was going to make was precisely what Brian made, which is by the very nature of staff versus, um, you know, uh, clients or students, they're going to be on two different time schedules and the staffing is going to come early and leave late, most likely, depending on how long the after party goes. But that's a joke. But anyways, I think, I think we're right that we're looking at less overlap than than we need to worry about. It's good. Yeah, I think that the focus on particular numbers, I think we have to do it because there's no other way to be clear and specific about what we're talking about. But I don't think the issue, whether it's 50 or 52 or, um, but, but I think we have to establish some numbers. So I think that's reasonable. I am concerned though, when you say select people staying over, are you anticipating that perhaps 50 might stay over? And again, does that include significant others who may join later? So if we say 50 for the seminar, but that might, you know, wind up being 80 sleeping over yeah. it's a different number again. Well, okay. Gianna, she would you would word it so that it says on oh, you know, not more than 50 people can be on site, 50 attendees on site, you know, and then you know, with a footnote you know, about administrative or custodial staff might be an additional 10 or 12. I I don't don't quite know how we'd word that, but you just would refer to on site, you know? Okay. We could say that the, 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 how about the maximum number of, you know, people in a seminar or whatever program could be 50 um, and no more than, you know, 62 people can be on site at any one time, something like that. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the kind of Larry. Can you live with that or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I like the, the, the staggered arrival time that Brian and Mark. Yeah. Are I wasn't thinking about that, but that makes sense. Ms. Gray, Ms. Seaborn, Mr. James, are you OK with that idea? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's consistent with with what we've proposed. Yeah. So. I think that's I think that makes sense. OK. The, uh, and the, uh, I know in your statement of use, you list out days and times, but I think maybe we should review, um, we should review that with the board because it's, although it's nine to six for programming, there's also after hours. So I think that should just be defined somewhere or at least discussed. Yeah. So the typical, um, you know, day long programming and, you know, there's, there could be you know, a half day program, there could be full one day program, two day program, three day program. Um, When it is a full day, we anticipate it would be nine to six. Um, There may also be programs as as we mentioned, some of the folks involved have 
you know, um, regular nine to five jobs. Um, so there may be a program that perhaps starts at, at four or five and goes to, to eight o'clock. Um, so typically it would be the nine to six, but there may also be evening programs as well. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps clarify or <laughs> um, uh, just, you know, provides additional information. Um, Oh, I, I guess I was trying to to understand when it's one to three days, do any people stay over in the mansion? Any of the participants, you know, I know you, you know, you have your staff and, but who stays over or don't they? Yeah, it's possible that there may be, as we mentioned in the materials, that there may be um, select uh, participants that would be permitted to stay overnight. Um, as Marianne mentioned, a lot of that is going to be governed by the New York State Code and as far as how many people and, and what the, that looks like. Um, but I, 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 I think a majority of the participants would stay in, in local hotels. But does the board have an issue with that in terms of writing anything into the conditions? I mean, no, does it? I don't think so. I mean, why do you get? Yeah. Mark, I didn't hear what you said. I'm just trying to clarify. You mean of having guests stay over? Oh, yeah, people staying over. Does that make any difference in terms of the conditions? I don't think so. Probably not. I mean, I say, you know, it's, I, I know you want to know, but I don't. I don't think any can. You know, that would need to have any condition. Uh, I think okay. they still got to face the the traffic and noise limitations. So yeah, right. Yeah, and the whatever the building code says they're allowed to house. Well, yeah. There's a lot well, of- If they stay over, they'd be coming and going <laughs> two right. trips less, right? Yeah. Um, two trips fewer. All right. Um, I so, think on the, we, so on the hours, I mean, did, I'm not sure that we have exact language on the hours. Is, and well, I don't no, know what we have. don't. I mean, do you want- do, uh, it sounds to me, unless the board wants to, that, that it isn't something that can be easily, you know, written into a condition because it seems that there's some irregularity, you know, there's going to be some evening programs, some, you know, some that start at nine, some that start at noon. Did you I, have something? Yeah, but I would think the condition would be on the back end that we agreed upon eight o'clock during the weekdays and, and 10 o'clock on the weekends for, for ending. Mm -hmm. For noise, right. But that was in regards to noise. That yeah. was, yeah, that wasn't when the programs ended. I mean. So as long as we're, if we're operating within those noise limitations and there's no, you know, outward impacts to, to the nearby residents, um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a concern about, you know, if there's a program that goes until 11 o'clock, if it's, you know, completely within Bill of the war would not fly to house. I don't know why that would bother anybody. Right. Well, hold it, hold it. Just let me give it's not so hypothetical because what happens after the program is over, we're assuming not that many people, let's say no one is staying over at the house at the mansion. That means whoever has to leave has to leave at you know eleven o'clock at night, which means there's a burst of traffic activity in a residential neighborhood at 11 o'clock at night or 11 to 12, depending on how long it takes to get everyone out. So there is an impact. I mean, we can't just say that it can run, you know, that it can run until it stops and then there's no impact. I'm not sure what to, to make of it, but people leaving is going to be, you know, just, a big, just as big of an event, if not more so than people coming especially if it's later at night, then every little aspect of the noise is going to, you know, set people's blood pressure going higher and higher. Right. Just, so in that event, you'd have a solution. I'm just pointing out the issue. Right. Right. So in that event, you'd have um, a, 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 at least one, um, if not more jitney trips, um, you know, uh, the jitney service picking folks up from the site and bringing them the quarter mile down the road to the offsite parking location. Um, and then you, once the, the participants leave, you would have the uh, support staff uh, leaving the site in their individual you know, personal vehicles.
Yeah, I, I don't think the support staff is the issue. I do think the jitneys might prove to be an issue, especially if you had, let's say, 50 people. So that could be, you know, three, four two or three. five jitney trips, depending on the size of the jitney. Mm -hmm. and how quickly people come out to load, you know, how, you know, last minute hellos, goodbyes, and information exchange can go on for a while sometimes. I guess it just comes back down to noise, you know, how much are, you know, neighbors aware that, you know, there are four jitneys with, you know, 10 people all leaving, you know, between 10 and 1130. And, you know, they're calling Brian or the police or saying, why is there so much activity? We thought this was just a seminar. Um, so I'm just trying to put myself in there um, shoes and, and understand what kinds of things would bother potentially people nearby on a regular basis, twice a month. You know, if it happened once a year, people would say, oh, you know, you know, Connie's having a party. I don't have any parties, but <laughs> um, I would say that twice a month, if that became a regular thing, if I were the neighbor, I might be annoyed by that much activity coming and going, you know, turning on, turning off, people getting on, saying goodbye, saying, so it could be disruptive. That's what the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. If it's that how, late, yeah. How do you address that, except to say things, you know, things can't run that late. I'm not sure if that's a valid way to address it, but that's, you know. I, I was going to suggest before, and I, I don't know if we're there yet, but I was going to suggest that since this is your needs that you're trying to capture in this language, maybe you should propose the language for us and the board can react to it. It won't be tonight. But so in, in, a, in a little bit, I'm, I'm suggesting we punt this, but just so that you can clearly outline what the needs are and the board can react to it. Now, I mean, you got some pretty good parameters, I think, listening to them talk, but we just want to, I mean, if we simply say like what was in your statement of use was, was 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but it's not 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So tell us what you think it needs to be. And then we can react to that. I mean, yeah, is it, is that, is that, I, I think that's a great idea. I think we can go back and we can, we can come up with some language uh, for the board to review. Okay. Right, because we are getting close to being in a situation where we're insisting some people stay over to minimize the traffic. <laughs> we want to be there either. Um, so, you know, this is, we, 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 I think it's a little clunky trying to work it out, but we are trying to figure out the best collaborative approach and how we can make this work for everybody, including, of course, the neighbors. But, but yeah. yeah, why don't you get back to us with some of those specifics as Larry suggested. Yeah, yeah, and w again, we, we appreciate this this format. I know sometimes it's, you know, it's not pleasant watching the sausage being made, <laughs> which is kind of what we're doing here. We're trying to, to put this together, trying to work out the details. Um, but in the end, I think it'll, it'll result in a good product. So um, okay. we appreciate the discussion. All right, so I, I guess it's kind of, I think we've covered everything on, on that, on the, all right, so let's move to, to tours. Um, you know, and the question is kind of which days of the week, how frequently will they be? Will they overlap with the seminars? Because if you're going to have, you know, you had proposed 50 people on a tour, that seems like a lot. But, but if that's going to overlap with seminars, you know, the maximum number of people per tour, um, you might want to talk about the number. 50 seems high. Um, and then, yeah. and then the same, like for instance, the limit, the limit on um, at the Octagon House is 20 people per tour. Um, so 50 is a big jump from that. And then, and then I guess the advanced reservations, will advanced reservations be required? So those are sort of the concerns. Maybe, maybe you would want to address them. Sure. So this is something that, um, that we included, not because it's part of our 
regular programming. Um, but because we anticipate that we'll probably be approached by folks like the historical society or um, schools to have tours um, or, you know, individual community groups um, to have tours of, of the site. So we wanted the flexibility to, to be able to say yes um, to having tours at the site without being in violation of, of the special permit um, if it wasn't included within the, the types of activities that we were allowed to do. Um, we do anticipate having um, sort of a, an open, a community open house um, a couple times a year on, you know, say a Saturday from 10 to 2 um, to, uh, to, to provide uh, tours of the site. Um, and just allow the community to, to come and, and, and observe the, the house and, um, and, and learn about the history. Um, but beyond that, we really are, we're open to, to the village's input here. Um, uh, I think we chose 50 just because that was the maximum number of participants for our program. So we figured 50 is, is satisfactory for that. Perhaps 50 would be satisfactory for the tours. Um, it's, it, we're, like I said, we're, we're very much open to the village's input here. Um, we do not anticipate, we, we, in fact, the, the tours would not overlap with our programming. Um, while the programming and the seminars are occurring, that's, that, that is the focus of what's going on on the site, because that's, that's the whole purpose of the Institute. Um, so we wouldn't want anything to interfere or disrupt um, that programming. Um, so it would, the tours would not overlap. Um, and I think we would prefer there to be advanced registration just so to, you know, control the number of, of people coming so that we can, you know, abide by the limitations um, that, that, that will be in the special permit. Um, but again, we're, we're open to, to the village's input here. Well, you know, Marianne mentioned 20. Um... Even if you had an open house from 10 to two, which is a lovely idea. I mean, the community would love that. Um, I would say, you know, you'd register people, you know, for however long the tour is, is a, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, maybe it takes an hour or an hour and a half. And, a, and then you have registrations at certain times and people, so that, you know, you don't have a hundred people or 200 people coming at an open house. I know open house sounds very open, but I'm not sure, <laughs> at least in the first year of this, maybe that's not the best way to, to approach that. So, I mean, I, I, I don't have to mastermind this, but I would say some kind of registration with maybe 20 people on a tour, you know, for however long it takes, and then um, have those registered on the dates when you know you don't have um, seminars and um, advertise them, you know, in the ways that you suggested, which is very consistent with what I've heard from groups, um, you know, historical society, school groups, um, all of that is, uh, I think, would go a long way. And uh, for people who are interested here and nearby who want to, as you say, you know, learn about the history of the house and, and your mission. So um, something like that is, is what's in my mind for that. Well, I think the number should be higher than 20, but only because if we have a school group going, let's say, you know, are classes limited to 20? I think we should have some number like maybe 30 or 35 is a reasonable number. But, you know, again, it's going to be the more people that's going to take, you know, it's harder to move a tour with a lot of people than it is to move a tour with less people. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. I'd stick with the smaller number for tours. Um, just, you know, even, even a school group, it's better. Well, what if you said 25, you don't have any classes that are bigger than 25. Right. I think that is a class limit for Derek. Well, that's fine. Whatever the, that sounds fine. As long as we can get, you know, handle a class, that's fine. That was um, now, do you guys can, now, Jennifer, so who do you think would be, or, or William, or maybe or William or Erica, no, who would be, who would be giving the tours? Are you envisioning that if a school teacher brings in the school teachers doing the tour, or do you have a staff person who'd be giving the tour? William, Erica, have have we 
worked that out, that, that level of detail? So we haven't worked it out to that level of detail. I mean, we, the Institute doesn't have staff. And obviously, I think if we did, they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't do the house justice in the way that someone who is very well versed in okay. the history. So like I was given a tour by Steve Tilly. He knows yeah, I was everything. Gonna about say, that was, like, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, and we would want people to have that sort of experience. Um, but yeah. you know, we haven't. We haven't okay. Had. I mean, that doesn't have to be in there. Who's giving the tour, but I was just curious because to know how roughly how, how long a tour would be. Um, yeah, and I, I think it would probably also, it would depend on who's giving it, you know, for children, it would probably be shorter than uh, the historical society. Who yeah, well, this, the, 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 let me read you the conditions we had on the Octagon House tours and um, see if these are something you, you could live with. Um, they, they can be visited only by guided tours, um, which you've already agreed to. Tours must be by appointment only, and the maximum number of persons permitted on each tour is 20 maybe we'd up there to 25. Um, and then it says the house and grounds may be open for guided tours from 9.30 to four with the hours we had on Octagon House. The maximum number of tours per day is four and the maximum number of days per week on which tours may be conducted is five. Um, tours will be approximately 50 minutes long and must be scheduled so as to permit at least 40 minutes between the conclusion of one tour and the commencement of the next. I think that's an important uh, um, condition, you know, so you get the cars in and out. I mean, now does the board, does the board care? I mean, I, the reason I'm asking them, as you said, it's up to the board on this stuff. <laughs> do you care what the hours of the tours are? What days of the tours do you care about there? Well, I, I think it makes a difference. I think we should try to avoid times a day where congestion on Broadway is the worst, you know? And then, I mean, to me, that's the, that's the key issue. I don't know that weekday versus weekend is a bigger issue. So, so what, actually, what about 9.30 to, to, to three, actually, because if it's four o'clock and they've got to be 50 minutes, so getting out of there at five, which is the absolute worst time on Broadway. Well, the other worst time is when the, middle school, high school gets out. So that's, <laughs> that's just about three, right? 3.30, 3, 3, 30. What's, what's the time frame? Someone help me out here. Yeah, I think it's around 3.30, 3, 3, 3.40. So the school gets out. All I know is once it gets about three o'clock, I start seriously questioning if I'm going to Tarrytown. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, you could have... You can have weekends also. I mean, that's not weekend tours um, are part of, uh, aren't, aren't they, uh, Marianne, with the octagon? It's not limited to weekdays. It doesn't have particular days. It just says five days a week. I mean, you, you don't, I mean, the thing about, the thing that is a little bit different is at Octagon House, the tours are, I think, are a little bit more of a regular thing than they seem to be. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. We wouldn't have we wouldn't yeah. have hours posted for tours. So I don't to be think available. it's as important to put a you know limit on the number of days. You might want to on the hours though. Yeah. Um I mean I think I think 9:30 is probably okay in the morning, right? I think things are, yeah, are clearing up by then, but do you want to? I mean 9:30 to 4 seems to make sense for the weekends. You might want an earlier time during the week, but it's or even nine thirty to five on weekend, nine to five on weekends. I don't know, but uh, but then if we talk about it, we're talking about real weekends now. We're not talking about school children weekends, right? What? <laughs> well, Sky, I doubt you're going to get many school children on the weekends. No, we we had a discussion before. We said that that. We were going Sunday through Thursday. And oh, then yeah, 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 yeah. We're talking Saturday, Sunday, and Monday through Friday on this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think. Say, say nine, 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 to, nine to three on the, during the week and nine to five. Works for, me. Works for me, Connie. Yeah, okay. 
Nine to three Monday to Friday. And what time, Connie? And nine, nine to five on the weekends. For nine to five weekends. For any tours, right. And I, I don't think we have to really sort of get into the length of the tour, the no, even yeah. the number of tours per day, as long as you've got that requirement that there has to be at least 40 minutes between tours. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Especially okay. this is not, I know this isn't your main thing. And it's, it's in a way, it's something that I think would be very positive to the community um, and, uh, you know, a very um, welcoming kind of thing. Okay. Oh, and then the ma the maximum number of people. Well, you said I I think then twenty five. The twenty five that you twenty five. Okay. Plus the tour guide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. All right. And now now for now for the fun part: special oh. events. <laughs> um. And. <clears throat> Where, you know, there, there's, you know what the open questions are on this, how many per year, the maximum number of attendees per event. Um, will the attendees be known in advance of the program um, or what, you know, whatever it is of the event, who will sponsor the events? I mean, I think, um, you know, everybody, the board all agrees, and I think you have too, that the Board of Trustees approval has to be secured for any special event, but there still have to be some, some outside um, outside parameters. Um, I don't know if maybe maybe the board members wanna say something about this first and then, um, and then, or do you wanna do, do want to hear from- Can I just ask one question, which I think is kind of like a threshold sort of place setting question. I just wanna make sure that we're all kind of on the same page as far as what is a special event. Um, and, you know, I think we, we just would like to understand what the village is envisioning um, when, when, we, when it says special event. Um, what is it considering to be a special event that would qualify for well, um, approval by, by the Board of Trustees in the, in the future? Well, I think we got that language from you. you. You asked, that was one of your subheadings with special events, and you said that they would be, um, uh, events that relate to the charitable purpose of the organization. And so I guess it's sort of our question, what kind of, what, what are some examples of those? I mean, I think we, we got on that a little bit at the, at the last meeting, but maybe you'd elaborate and, and, and the board could, you know, um, pursue that with more questions that they might have. Sure. So, I mean, I think there, the, the term special event will, will really run the gamut. So um, we're looking at it as, you know, it, it could be something like a fundraising event, um, a, a luncheon to a gala. Um, it could be a reception um, celebrating black owned businesses, um, but it could also be something like a photo shoot for black owned businesses. Um, something that would potentially have far less people involved um, than, than the regular programming of the Institute. So for example, a photo shoot may only have something like 15 to 25 people total um, on the site at one time for a few hours, one afternoon. Um, is that something that we would have to come back to the Board of Trustees to seek approval for? Um, so I just, I wanna make sure that we're, we're sort of striking the right balance. Um, when we're talking about special events, um, you know, another um, uh, thing that we've been approached a few times is a request for filming um, from a, a TV studio, NBC, ABC. Um, our, our view is that that would likely be, that's regulated separately through a filming permit, likely through the village. Um, but if it is, are we on the same page with the village that that's something that would be regulated through the filming permit process versus being categorized as a special event um, being held at Villa Luaro, especially if we're talking about putting a cap on how many special events can occur at the site um, per year. So um, there's, I think special event covers a, a broad range of types of, of activities. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're all, we're not talking about a special event being a pyre moss 
um, you know, four, what? five, six hundred person oh. event at all times. I I think the things like filming and photography. I mean, I don't know about photography how that's managed, but I'm I'm comfortable with the notion that a filming uh, or TV event would go through the normal permit process for that. At least I am, but. Can Larry Shopford, does that make sense to you? Well, yeah, no, I, I would highly recommend that we continue that, you know, through the existing filming law. Um, a photo shoot, a paid photo shoot actually is covered by our filming law as well. So if it's a paid photo shoot, I mean, obviously, if you're just on your property taking pictures, that's different. But um, yeah, but if you're, if you're using the property and receiving a fee for the photo shoot to take place, that's something that's regulated by our filming code. So and I would, I don't recommend that we step on that in any way because that process, I mean, that it works overall, it works. I mean, you, you've dealt with it over many years, I'm sure. So I don't see any reason to, to change that. Um, so let's leave that part out of it, I think. I agree. Um, Can I give, um... I want to I want to get a, some clarification for the photo shoot because I, I actually have one request right now, which is for uh, a group of African American women sorority, and they are also a nonprofit, so they fit within the institute's um, mission. So they want to come and just take a photo on the front steps and see the inside of the property. Now, to me, that doesn't constitute a photo shoot. Um, that's just more of a visit. So, I, and I also don't want that to fall into a special event. So, where would things like that fall? To me, that's well, the Girl Scouts has, has asked things like that. That sounds closer to a tour almost. You know, like they want to come and see the property, and as part of the process, they're taking a picture on the front steps. I okay. mean, that's what would happen during a tour, and most likely, anyways. I could the, be right. the the filming permit kicks in when there's a when there's a fee that changes hands for that activity. Uh, now, I mean, if, there's, if there's no fee for a photo shoot, then where would we fall? I, I don't think that's currently regulated, but that, I, would, I don't know if I can really make that determination on the spot, but I, you know, in, in the hypothetical situation. But I, yeah, I didn't think it would fall under the the filming permit, because like you said, it does no monies are, are exchanged. Um, yeah. Technically, it's, it's not a tour. They are just there doing a photo shoot for, say, a print ad. Well, may, maybe maybe you want to list that. I mean, it's, it's it comes up a lot, which makes me think that maybe you're expecting them to be fairly frequent, and maybe that should be a, a separate use, you know, on your statement of uses. Would be photo shoots and 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 you know and what what you what you've got in mind are they going to be on you know different days from when you're having um, a, a program um, you know how many people they'd have to meet the same parking requiements and stuff like that yeah does, I mean, I think does, does that make sense to anybody uh, I think yeah, is I it mean, more like film film getting like a film permit more like in that c category and be dealt well no I mean I think you'd have to clarify. Um, the, you, you, you're talking about um, um, events that that are not um, covered by the by the um, by the by the film permit by the film permit process. Because I, I agree with Larry. I mean, I think I think it makes sense for for that. But they're talking about photo shoots, you know, that 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 don't fit into the film permit law. But I do think yeah. some kind of de minimis too, like if. You know, six people want to come take a, a picture, and they're you know, and for for whatever reason, like to me, it's not. Again, I think you know, we're trying to prevent the impacts on the neighborhood more than, you know, the actual use itself. So you know, like I think you'd have to have a, a some some bottom number as well that if it's less than, you know, twenty people are going to be there in total, then it's you know, it's, it doesn't fall into anything, so it's not going to impact anybody. But if the activity, if, if the acti the hypothetical activity doesn't fit within the requirements of the film permit, then it's not regulated, which I, I mean, currently, I mean, I don't know legally what it, what it is, but currently those are activities that take place on any residential property anywhere in the village. 
In other words, if, if, a, if the Girl Scouts came to the mayor's house and wanted to take a picture of him standing in front of his house, I mean, that's, it's not a regulated activity, you know? So, but th there, are, there are details, I'm looking at them now, but I mean, you can all look at them separately afterwards to understand what it means, but it really talks about a fee changing hands or, you know, a commercial activity. And, the, and if that's what's happening, then a, a filming permit's required. If it's not a commercial activity, then it's a residential activity, right? I mean, I don't know, Marianne, you probably have a better, better view of that, but we, we don't tell people they can't take pictures on their property or... No, but a photo shoot something different. It doesn't, doesn't happen much, you know? I mean, it's not something well, that comes... I can't say... You said I might have an answer, but I haven't seen it come up. Sure, but that it's because we would never... We would never if someone contacted us and said, we're having a photo shoot, there's no fees changing hands, it's not a commercial production, the answer is, have a nice day. Well, it would be unless there was there were traffic considerations. Yeah, or, if there or, were a lot of people. Let okay, let's 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 go back to um the, to the example um uh, William gave. You know, there's a, a um a black sorority, and they're having, you know, they're they're having their reunion someplace. I don't know. They're having their reunion in Terrytown, and they want to have a picture taken. And it's a great big group of people. Great big of women, it's our sorority. Then it's you know fifty women in this sorority coming up for this photo shoot. I, I do think that's different than you know Mary, somebody just taking a picture. I'm, I'm just house. reading the. I'm just reading what the law is now, and I, that doesn't fit. So it doesn't need... fit that law, no. But I'm sure. saying, I know, I know it doesn't fit into the law we have now. So the question is, is that something you want regulated by the special permit? That's Mary the Marianne, let me give you a better example because the example of the sorority, um, as Mark mentioned, that would fall more into a tour. They would have a tour, then they would take their board of directors photo in front of the house. Um, the photo shoot that I'm thinking about would be, a good example would be um, some of the companies that receive coaching. They may have the need to do a photo shoot for their product. And if they would like to have the photo shoot done at Villa Loero, there may be as little as five people there. There may be 10. They're typically very small photo shoots. They'll have four models, two or three photographers, and, and one or two of our staff there. So, you know, it doesn't fall under, I don't think it falls under the filming part other than, I mean, I'm not quite sure if an ad campaign falls under commercial use or not. So I, I, I want to just throw out another suggestion. Um, you know, we've been talking about as providing examples, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the content and, and what the specific event, the purpose of the event, who would be attending. Um, but when we're talking about regulating for impacts, I'm wondering if maybe just kind of shifting the focus and looking more at the numbers and, and maybe saying, you know, there's a a baseline if you have more than X number of people that will be on the site at any given time, the requirement is that offsite parking has to be utilized. Um, then, you know, we can talk about the an, an upward cap whereby if there's over X number of people that will be on the site or X number of guests or attendees, maybe that triggers another level of review. Um, but something that's a little bit more like objective and, and not looking at the content or the purpose of the event. Because um, any, any event that we hold there has to be consistent with the charitable nature of, of the Institute. And that's sort of, that's self-regulating. Well, that's okay. something that is in but our interest. Is sure that you keep referring to the charitable purpose of the organization. And I guess I'm a little confused by that when you talk about, and I think I might be missing something when you're talking about advertisers wanting to come there. So promoting black owned businesses is, is part of the, the charitable purposes of, of the Institute. And Erica, maybe you can help elaborate a little bit more on that, but you know, that the property um, as a, as a not-for-profit, the property is, has to be used for its charitable purposes. Um, 
So, you know, it's within Villa Luaro's interest to make sure that it's not booking um, any kind of event there, whether it's a photo shoot, um, a, a, a TV filming event um, that is completely and wholly unrelated to the advancement of, of women of color um, and, and, and specifically women of color in an entre entrepreneurial ship, um, um, you know, relative to, to entrepreneurial ship. Just, just, a, just a, a footnote question then when I hear what Eric has to say about that. But where, is there some place where we can see the definition of the charitable purpose of the organization? It's referred to, but I, I haven't s s seen it. So, is it, uh, yeah. Sure, it's not, um, well, there is a way that you could see a brief description, but I can send, I can, we can circulate the full description. Um, oh, that'd be, that'd be that, really helpful. That we used in the IRS application. Oh, that'd be um, helpful, thanks. Sure, um, but what Jennifer said is perfect. I mean, we, we receive requests all the time uh, that we deny because, you know, they're not, they have nothing to do with our charitable purpose. They just want to, come to a pretty location to take pictures. Like we just denied one recently for a clothing company that we all know that just wanted to do a holiday campaign at a site that is very nice. And we said, no, we can't do it. Um, so we really, we really do try to link with um, black entre entrepreneurship, um, women of color, um, black history, um, all of those, all of those things. Well, so suppose somebody, for example, wanted to replicate that wonderful group picture, Jennifer, that you showed us last time of the people who were gathered when Madam Walker lived there, there were, you know, it looked like a hundred people standing in the back. Suppose somebody wanted to replicate that event, you know, um, that, that sounds wonderful and praiseworthy and it's also 100 people and this time they would well, it was actually 270 Jim. okay sorry and this time they'd probably be more reliant on vehicular modes of transport than they would have been in the in the days when that was a dirt road so these are the kind of situations and again i'm not asking you to list every possible thing that might possibly happen i think we have to look at sensible parameters of function and numbers and hours. And I agree with whoever said it before, trying to just apply that to whatever the kind of event is probably makes more sense than drilling down to, you know, whether we call it a photo shoot or whether we call it an educational program. Just my thinking. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that, you know, in, in that circumstance, a 270 person photo shoot um, to replicate the, you know, that historic photo, um, you know, I think obviously that would fall above the threshold of anything that would require offsite parking. So it would be required to, to utilize the offsite parking. And then I think the sort of the elephant in the room and the question is, you know, is that, you um, is that the, the, you know, that the number uh, by which we would have to come back to the Board of Trustees to seek some kind of approval from the Board of Trustees? Is there a process whereby instead of coming to the Board of Trustees, we can go to, um, to Larry's office and work with Larry to make sure that all of the necessary protocols are in place? Um, you know, have a checklist of items to make sure traffic control is in place with, with, um, with off-duty police officers if necessary. Um, that you know that, that that all of those items are are, are checked off. Um, I, I, we don't want to have to be coming back to the board of trustees too often. <laughs> I know you you have busy agendas where you're um, you know taking care of um, a, a lot of important items for the village. Um, so I'm just trying to think of is there a way where um, we can factor in some backstop, so to speak, um, without being too burdensome to, to the Board of Trustees. Could, could I throw something out there? Um, we had talked before about um, any, any special events requiring Board of Trustees approval. And, and, and you, you, you make a good point. I mean, there, are, there might be occasional events that are um, 
not exactly that, that aren't seminars or tours or whatever. And, and let's say it involves, you know, 15 people. It seems kind of crazy. They have to go to the board of trustees for that. But what about if you said any event, um, you know, um, involving more than whatever our other cap was, 62, I think, right? Requires board of trustees approval. Idea. I mean, how does the board feel about that? That's a reasonable thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going in the beginning with uh, yeah, the. Yeah, I don't. If we. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say there are probably going to be a lot of exceptions that grow over time, like the photo shoot. It's so I think some sort of upward quantity of people that once you exceed that, then you're in a special permit process. Makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, was, in, a, in a special, special permit, yes. a special it, event process. We'll call it a special event. Process. I had been to probably three events at Bill Lawaro with the previous owner that had probably a hundred people, um, you know, special events, fundraisers, uh, Juneteenth celebration, I probably had 200 people. And there wasn't, there weren't a lot of impacts, you know? So I think that it's, it's, again, it's, we had, you know, kind of um, one huge event uh, that, you know, we, which is what I think we keep thinking about when we hear special events. So I think there is definitely a size that does not need to be as heav heavily regulated because it is on Broadway and, you know, like it, it's, um, you know, so I, there, that's definitely a, something we have to consider. Because, um, you know, no one ever complained about those other events, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and we haven't had, frankly, any complaints about any, any uses of Villa Lawaro until you know, we had kind of a world-class fashion shoot that, you know, we were unprepared for, so. Yeah, but Brian, now it wasn't being used that much. I mean, so you can't, oh. you can't, and here you've got vibrant, you know, sure. um, a vi a there, vibrant but, donors with the mission, so you can But Ambassador Dooley probably had five or six special events a year that were hundred people. He, he was a big uh -huh. fundraiser for. Oh, that, I'm sorry. You know what? I, when when I was saying throwing out the requiring board approval for for any event over, you know, whether it's 62 people, whatever, I, I meant to also say that I th I think that the board um, needs to fix it fix a cap that you don't you, you, if you want an event with, let's say 400 people, don't even come. You know, um, and that 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 you need you need an out the board needs an outside number. I mean, it, just to make it um, more reasonable for 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 the applicants. We were thinking if we can uh, here. Um, I'm sorry, Jeff. I, I was just going to say I thought the idea of a tiered approach would be, I guess, the best. So anything, I think, 62 for a special event is too low. So if we're over say 200, then we definitely would need the permission from the board. Um, anything less than that, we could coordinate with Larry and his office to make sure we're meeting all of the various parameters. And just to your point, Marianne, also on the, the ultimate cap, I mean, if we can, if that, if that structure that William just described is something that would be put in place, so that any event over say 200, we'd have to come back to the board to seek approval for that. If we can demonstrate through that process that we're, that we're planning appropriately and that we have all of the, the, the checks in place so that any impacts to the neighborhood are, are really minimized um, and limited, um, you know, uh, is it, would the board consider at least giving us the opportunity to present that to the board, to have the opportunity to, to make that case rather than close off that opportunity right off you the mean, bat. Well, well, what about when you come back for your renewal for your special permit? And you said, we've had these many events and there haven't been, and then the board could consider um, upping the limit then. That's another way to do it. But I, th I, think, I think the board has to, to um, um, address this notion of, of um, um, you know when when they have to come to you. Janice, you're on mute. Oh. Janice, you're on mute. 
one of my concerns has been to talk about being approached by the Institute will be approached to host special events which relate to the charitable purpose. So you're talking about other organizations running events at the site, correct? They might have some, they might have some nexus with you, but it's not, if these are not all going to be events that the organization runs, there will be other ones. Yes, and no, we ultimately we're responsible. It's it's our property. It's our special permit. It, okay. We are. That's, I just want that to be really, really, really clear. Absolutely, that, and it's within our best interest to make sure that all of the conditions are abided by at risk okay. of losing the special permit. So that right. that's they, absolutely understood. They sign a okay. contract with us. Okay. All right. But some of these may be for commercial purposes. Am I correct about that too? Since part of your mission, understandably, is to encourage entrepreneurship, then some of the events are going to have a commercial purpose? Maybe. It could be. So um, I'm not saying that's a yes, no, up, down, but it's just that makes it a different, something we really have to consider what kind of event it would be and what, you know, other parameter issues perhaps. So what question, Marianne, did you pose? You said we were talking, you know, we- Two questions, Connie. Right, yeah. Number one is, do you want an, do you want an outside cap? Don't eat- On special you, events. On any event. Okay, on any. You want an outside cap. I guess you sort of have the cap of 62 right. for the regular program. Okay. okay, that's question number one. Question number two is should they have to should they have to come to the board of trustees for any other of these events, you know, besides their their regular programming of up to 62 people or should there be the, the approach that Jennifer suggested of up to a certain amount, they can just go to Larry, but if it's more than X amount, then it has to go to the board of trustees. I, th I think that's the question out there. Well, Set of questions out there. I just want to point out that I feel that it's gonna be high profile enough and probably generating criticism. It's gonna be more, we need to treat it more like a film permit in the sense of all the, a lot of the details can be worked out with Larry's office. I think, especially in terms of larger events, I think the board still has to have, have oversight because we're gonna be the first line of questions when, when they come in. Someone's gonna pull Connie or Janice over or one of us over and start chopping our ears off about you know the issues and didn't we know what was going to happen? So it's it gives me concern that things would just ride totally independently of any kind of board review whatsoever. But I might just be, you know, being too rigorous about it. Well, and, and Larry, you know, Schaffer, your your office. I mean, you're set up for filming. You're set up for certain things. Yeah. You know, are we creating, we have this middle ground, are we creating a, 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 a difficult situation for your office that doesn't make sense? You don't have to answer um, that, I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm not worried about working out the logistics because we, we would need to work out the logistics in any event. As Mark mentioned, you know, we, we would be doing the, the legwork of gathering all the information and, you know, kind of fleshing out the details and, uh, and then the board would would be involved at that point. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. I, I think I think why we're um, maybe I'm stating the obvious here, but I think why we're struggling with this is that um, you know when when the board adopted this law to allow the use of these properties, um, I think the idea of large special events was was not really the focus at that time. So you're now asking them to um, to to digest that and it's and it's very difficult. So maybe I'm just stating the obvious, but it's that's why we're struggling with with how to do this. So I, th I don't think I don't think any 
special event except some de minimis threshold should go without board approval because of that. You know, the, the other items, you know, the, the other items fit, in my opinion, fit squarely within what the board had envisioned. So with the right parameters, which I think we all just worked out um, and everyone seemed fairly comfortable with them, with the right parameters, they can run on autopilot, you know, <laughs> and that's what we all want. Um, the special events are just a different animal and I, and I don't think that should get beyond the board of trustees. Again, over a certain, you know, minimum threshold, of course. I, you know, I agree there. I, you know, I don't think there's any problem with, with meeting with Larry's office prior to coming to the board's approval to work out, you know, issues and, and, and situations. Um, but I think any one of these special events is going to have to come in front of the board on a case by case basis. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there, there, there needs to be a high end cap. Um, written, I just think the board needs to take all of this into account. I see no reason why, um, as it's been shown that these events have been handled appropriately, that there's any reason for the next event or the event after that to be, you know, proportionally larger. Um, so I don't see, you know, I wouldn't say that, you know, don't come to us if your event is over 150. I think, I think you can ask for whatever you want to ask for. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, you know, certainly given the, 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 the um, you know, initial, you know, I don't want to use the word train wreck uh, um, because I know, uh, I know it's viewed differently by, by, by the people, uh, you know, in Phil Loaro. I know uh, whether it's a hiccup or whether it's a, and you know, an event that puts Irvington on the map. The fact is that was a traumatic experience for a lot of people um, who then you know came back to us. So we have a responsibility, but I think you know we also want to see this work and we want to see this be a positive you know experience. So again, what, what, while I don't think there needs to be a total cap number above which you shouldn't even approach us. I think that you should also be aware, perhaps by starting on smaller numbers and smaller events and having those work successfully, that that can open the door to controlled larger events. Yeah, I, what you're saying, Larry, makes a lot of sense to me. And I think I mentioned, maybe Brian mentioned also, the idea that you're, you know, you're building time after time a sense of, oh, yeah, we know how to do this. We can make it work. It's a positive experience for the village. And each one builds on the one before. And, you know, there's there's less concern about the very top number um, once there's a lot of uh, good experiences that people have here in the village and you too. So the only question I have is just that, Middle cutoff, there's got to be a cutoff that makes sense for like a photo shoot where it doesn't fit into our existing regulation, but it's probably not any worse than, you know, a seminar class in terms of impact. So did we come to a final about that? If it's something that's less than 60 people or whatever the number is, then we don't really care. As long as all of the parking and that kind of you know, baseline stuff is taken care of. Is that is that what we're saying now? Or, and then anything above that becomes a special event permit? Well, well what about something like, you know, event, a, events, you know, that would result in um, fewer than 62 people, you know, but don't fit into one of these categories, seminars or tours or whatever have to be reviewed um, um, in the by the village approved by the village administrator and any any events involving that would you know end up with 62 or more people have to come to the board of trustees I mean I'm just throwing that out there you can fool around with the numbers but Larry Shopper, you you should first say whether that would work for you well I don't I don't have any issue 
you know, whatever the board decides, we'll handle it. Um, I'm comfortable with using that same cutoffs that you have for the uh, seminars because, you know, I know, I'm confident that that can work with the parameters that you've already laid out, you know, the parking lot. Right, yeah, you know, you know what the limits are. Yeah. Right, right. You know, um, so it's, that doesn't, that's not uncomfortable for me at all. So do you think that we should come to you, not we, the applicant should come to you for anything that isn't the core function that we've talked about in detail? So, I mean, I want to throw out like the feather shoot. So how would you deal with that, Larry? Do they need to come to you for approval? Or it's under 60, right? They have all the other parking and, and noise and whatever impacts that they've got to follow no matter what. I, you tell you tell me that you're, I, you're trying to make that decision, but I, I, I do. Why, if it's, I, in terms of, you know, if it's not the seminar, it's not any of those things that we've described in that use, it's something different. Um, and, you know, the, the public would want to be able to, to go to Larry's office or call the village and say, oh, they're doing something different than, than a seminar. And Larry gets to say, They've come in, you know, the, we've set up with the board that if the numbers are less than 62, uh, the applicant can explain what their purpose is and work it out with, um, with the administrator. And that's what it is, and it's fine. Um, so I can see it working that way, but it, it should yeah, it seems to It seems to me it's not really burdensome to stop in Larry's can, office or right, call Larry. Yeah. Can I just add, I mean, other than the content of the event for a program versus a reception, um, if the logistics are all the same, if it's a it's a 50 person program or a 50 person reception, I mean, what what is the the, the difference in terms of the impacts to the community? If we're allowed to have a 50 person program. It seems like, you know, other yeah, than the I'll content the of, the, of the event, it, it, which, which we've acknowledged, you know, shouldn't be necessarily regulated by, by the village. That's a self-regulating item. And, and the code does include um, activities of historical, educational, and or cultural facility, including but not limited to tours, meeting rooms, classrooms, exhibition, our archi archival space. There's a list of items, but it does say including but not limited to. So I, I appreciate that special events like this may not have necessarily been um, thought about at the time the local law was adopted, but certainly the text of the local law itself doesn't preclude them. Um, yeah, but no, but Jennifer, the, the special permit is a special permit to hold X kinds of events. And you've, you've defined what they are. And that's what the special permit's for. Now you're saying we might want to do something beyond that. Well, you can't just choose every beyond that. So that's why we're suggesting if it's not going to have a lot of people, get it approved by the, by, by, by the village administrator's office. So I guess I, I, we thought of special events as being part of the special permit, part of our application. Um, you know, looking at that language that says including but not limited to tours, meeting rooms, et cetera, suggesting that tours and, and meeting rooms would not be the only permitted purposes. Um, and the, the village, the, the local law does contemplate allowing the flexibility for other types of events related to historical education or, or the, the cultural facility, um, yeah. which, is, which is what we're proposing I see here. what you're saying as your special use. Well, the board's okay with that. I mean, that's, that's, that's for the board. Yeah, it just seems to me I like mean, we could, we could, you're right, we could. Required, if we're gonna be required to use the offsite parking for over X number of, of people being at the site, does it make a difference if it's a program versus a lunch? Um, it, 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 it sh I, I would submit that it shouldn't make a difference what the purpose of the event is, as long as the logistics are, are appropriately handled um, in accordance with the conditions of the special permit. Well, I'll so tell you one other reason. 
Yeah, I'll tell you one other reason it might make a difference, Jennifer, is, is you did give us some outside um, number of events that would be per quarter. What was it, like eight per quarter or something? For, um, no, two for to special? four programs per quarter, eight to 16 a year of yeah. the, the, the seminars and stuff. And, and then there might be a few tours of board. But then when you, there's all these other, there, there's these other things that it can be used for, then their number's bigger. You know, right. they, and we they, said up to five per year, up to five per year, which was consistent with what Mayor Smith had said the Dolies had used the facility for when they been. were. I was corrected by one of the neighbors that it wasn't that many, but I, I know I've went to two in a year, so I assumed I wasn't invited to all of them, but I don't, I'm not going to debate it. Let's say, but anyway, yeah, you guys did say one to five a year. That's why I was a little surprised when you said, when you were defining special events, you were talking about photo shoots and all those other things, because if those are included in one to five a year, you know, we probably <laughs> were worrying about a lot more than we need to, I think. So that's, you know, I think you were taking a broader definition of special event. Yeah. To us, we're thinking, you know, 150 one to people. five fashion shows. Yeah, exa exactly. That, that's kind of what we were thinking. Not one to five, you know, events outside of the, you know, kind of seminars, workshops and meetings, um, which. Right. So uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if, if that's the case, then, you know, it, it's, it's not that big a deal. But if it's going to be five, you know, 200, 500 people, you know, you know, having a, a kind of a, um, uh, some kind of event on the property, then th that's different. Um, a celebratory event or something. Um, so I think it's, I, I think I'm almost less clear with what you mean by special events now, because it seems that the definition of them got broader, but if it's still within one to five, if it's as broad as you said, it could be, you know, a sorority taking pictures for an hour and that's one of the five, then it's, that's not that big a deal. Um, so I think I'm a little, almost a little less. Uh, yeah. I think, so I, think, I think we got clarity tonight that, that the village would not consider the things like the, the photo shoot or, or filming for, you know, an NBC TV show, um, that those would be regulated separately and would not be classified as one of the special events under the special permit. They could be a, a tour, the, the sorority event would be a, a tour, perhaps um, photo shoot um, or the filming might maybe handled under the, um, the filming permit from the village. So I think we are down to more of the, what the village had traditionally thought of as the special permit, a reception, a fundraising event, um, um, a, a luncheon, a dinner, um, those types of events. And I, and I do think that the minimum number of the 60 people or whatever probably makes sense. Because if you're going to have a, a dinner for 30 people, I don't think anyone would even know what happened. You know, so, um, but I think once it gets kind of bigger than the kind of usual events and it's a, it's not the typical events, then I think that that's, that's to me when, when things have to kick in and we have to consider other impacts, in my opinion. Yep. So should the special event be determined by the size then instead of all of these different parameters we're talking about now? No, I don't think so, William. I, I think special event would be things that don't fit into what we said in the spec, you know, was in the spec. Oh, not not a seminar, not a tour, whatever. Then it's a special well, we event. Would, no, well, we would have to expand that definition then because like we just talked about, the photo shoot wasn't mentioned, but you know, you can do two photo shoots and no one would even know you were there. Yeah, and I know. Then, you know, we cut into our five special events and see you know, that's what I that's why fun. I said I'm gonna go back to my earlier suggestion because the photo shoot thing keeps coming up. Why don't you list as another thing the photo shoot? And then it doesn't we, get we can, we can you we know, can we can gladly not, add that we can gladly add that in. That's we can add that as a separate of photo category. Photo shoots not requiring a filming permit. Those that okay. Don't. Yeah, and, and, and I think, Marianne, I think your suggestion was good also. We, we've, we've obviously shared a lot of feedback tonight. Um, if you want to come back with a, you know, kind of adjusted proposal, I think that that probably makes sense, you know, because um, I think we have, we have clarified a lot of issues tonight. The, the one thing I think we do have to settle on is, does the board want to require any event um, involving more than 62 people to come to the 
Um, I think I think for the beginning we do. Board of trustees. I think I think it makes sense for for now, and then you know we can we can look at it again in a year. Maybe in a year it's anything less than 100. Then maybe you know then it's 150 because it's oh we've only gotten great feedback, you know, and it's there haven't been any issues. So I think for the I think uh, you know walking before we run is is a good idea here. Okay. I agree. I completely agree that especially in the beginning, it should come before the board for and it's all, it's only going to be one of five special events. It shouldn't, you know, it's not that onerous on the applicant or on, on us to be frank. Um, I, I guess the only, I mean, I, I don't disagree at all. I, I think this is the right approach. I'm just concerned about the number five for this, for the special event permit requirement, whatever you want to call them, the super special event. Um, what bothers me is I'm not sure where that number came from and is it reasonable or how does that impact the programming notion of what's, you know, the overall view of the programming? It seems low to me, actually. That's why I'm asking. But if they're committing to no more than five a year, then, you know, Larry's got a chalkboard. He can, yeah. he can mark it off, you know. And Jennifer, you were including in that five these non-filming permit photo shoots, right? So the five that came, we coming came up with the one to five per year, with the understanding that it was more of the the reception, the fundraising event. Um, as we started having further discussions with the board, we were concerned that the board would also consider these one-off things like a photo shoot to also be special events, pretty much anything unrelated to uh, the programming um, of the Institute. Um, so understanding that the photo shoot is now, a, would be handled as a separate category. Filming is a separate category regulated by the filming so permit. So the one to five works. I think the one to five works and William, Erica, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the one to five still works. Um, and I think, you know, in, in our internal discussions, I think it would be unusual to have five of these fundraising events, uh, receptions, luncheons, et cetera, um, in a year. That, that's gonna be on the upward level. And, up, and upward. my suggestion is gonna be that the first special permit just be for one year. And that, that's in everybody's interest. That's in your interest as well. So so then you can come back and say, we've had no issues, you know, can, can we go up to seven or whatever? And also, you know, um, should should make the the neighbors a little bit you know more comfortable that it's being reviewed that closely. So, and then that doesn't mean that every special permit can only be one year. Then maybe after that it would be you know longer. Yeah, as a practical matter, there's there's uh, renovations ongoing on the interior of and and exterior of the building itself. Um, so it, it's you know. I think it's unlikely that in the, the next year you'll see any of those large events there. Um, there there's work ongoing on a daily basis um, at, at the site um, that will want to be completed before any of these uh, fundraising events are held. Can I make a suggestion also? Um, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing is that um, when you're describing the special events, you're, you're describing them as, you know, receptions or dinners, galas, whatever you want to call it, but can, can you put a fine point on describing the types of events? And I say that because if you leave it wide open, which I'm sure it would be in your best interest, but if you leave it wide open, it will continually raise the concerns of our residents, I'm certain, and, and maybe other board members here. If it's, if it's just so wide open that, um, that we, they can't get comfortable with it. You know, we're, I think I'm speaking for the rest of the board when you use the words reception and gala and, you know, of, of a limited scale. I don't think anyone's terribly uncomfortable with that. But when you leave it wide open without those words, it's more uncomfortable. So if, if, if you can discuss that internally and come back with a, a little bit of parameters on, on it so that um, it probably would have a better chance of moving forward. Yeah. My guess. Essentially, define um, special events more precisely. As, as 
best you can. I, I know your yeah. your first reaction is probably going to be, I don't want to put limits on our, you know, but that's that's the problem here, you know, <laughs> is, is if you continually say no limits, the board's going to continually say we got a problem. Right. It's it's the balance between, right. um, you know, making sure that we have the parameters that make the village comfortable and the residents comfortable, but also providing the flexibility to really, you know, utilize the site yep. in a way right. that really, you know, maximizes its, its full potential. Um, it, it, in accordance with the charitable purpose. Um, you know, we can't anticipate every request that we may have from an organization that may want to, um, you know, use the site uh, for an event uh, within the parameters of the special permit. So it's it's hard to put an, an absolute, you know, ironclad, you know, exclusive know. <laughs> list together. But, um, you know, if the village is open to some level of flexibility, um, it will, we'll, We'll, we'll do our best to put something together within those yeah. parameters. Good. Thank you. It's a great attitude. And I, I, just have, I just have one correction. Um, I know Jennifer mentioned that we probably will not have any events during the construction, but we actually will have, more than likely, we will have something at the um, property, which is sort of why we're staggering the, the construction where the back terrace is taken care of first and you know, we may be able to utilize the, you know, the inside and the front steps and then working our way around to the front. So we will, you know, have some events, seminar, we may have some things in, within the next year or during the next year and a half, two years of the construction. Okay. Jennifer, you used one of my favorite words, balance. And I think that's <laughs> yeah. exactly right. You know, yeah, this, isn't, this, this is. isn't a win-lose situation at all. We're, we're simply trying to, to balance the various factors that we know and what we don't know. This is all new for all of us. And um, I think everybody will be more comfortable going forward if they know there's a review process um, in advance. I, I honestly, I see almost every land use application is it's a balance. Every application is a balance. And this is a, a perfect example. So okay. I think we're good. I'm, I'm looking forward to the, um, I think Eric, you were the one who said you could get us the mission of, um, you know, your nonprofit. And you know, I was just trying to, to find it, but if, it, if there are other names that, you know, you're, Nonprofit is under. I just couldn't find it when I was looking for it. But yeah, that, that'll also be helpful in structuring the special yeah. permit. Yeah. That language would be helpful for that. If the board could just stay on a second after after this is done. All right. Um, do you mind if we just talk logistics on dates? Um, oh, for the that's next. probably where you that. were going, Larry. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, that's we actually where I was going with the board. Okay. Well, well, no. I mean, I mean, like, I, what's I just... what's the next step? I mean, so let, you guys let me have make to... a suggestion. Okay. So, yeah. uh, well, I mean, obviously, there's a public hearing that's open. So, anyone that's watching this or watches this um, knows that uh, their voice can be heard at the public hearing on Monday. Now, if you have updated information in time for the agenda on Friday, we're happy to attach it and everyone can see it. I recognize the fact that that's fairly quick turnaround and. If you don't have any updated information, that's fine too. We'll we'll just have probably a, a little less comments on things, you know, unless people watch this this meeting. Um, in which case, we'll continue the hearing. I assume the board would do that. So, you know, it, it really is driven by what what you think you can turn around. I think. Sure. So I'll. I'll speak for, for our side and say, I, I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to be able to submit anything for Friday. Um, I, I don't think William or I'm sorry, William or, or Erica will disagree there. <laughs> um, it is a very tight turnaround time. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're, we're happy to, to attend the, the October 4 public hearing, um, but I'm wondering, is there an opportunity to adjourn the public hearing to a later date when we are able to provide more information so we can have a more productive um, comment session with the public. Is that something that the board would be open to? I mean, I, I, I think we already announced that we kept, we were going to hold it open. So I think what we'll do is we can, if you need more time than by our next meeting, we could, you know, suspend it and reopen a new one. But I think for Monday it'd be tough because we already said we would hold it over. So I think, I don't think we want to cancel that. Um, but it would be, you know, it literally would be, uh, we, the public hearings now open again. 
Um, there's no update from the applicant, but if anyone has any comments, feel free. And that would be pretty much it. And we'll, we'll, yeah. I guess we'll reference this as well, but. Um, yeah, and, and, and based, on the, based on the discussions of the September 29th work session, we're expecting updated information from the applicant, um, which you know would, we would assume would be at the next meeting in October. The 18th. Yeah, and if you thought it was going to be beyond that, then we could we could suspend the public hearing and start it again. But okay, okay, appreciate that clarification. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Thank you very much day. for your time. This was very helpful for us. Very productive. Um, so we appreciate it very much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So now is the board adjourning the uh, meeting? Is that because there's Mary and we, if we meet with you, it would be separate. So, okay. Yeah, I'll make, yeah, I'll make that. I can but I don't unless you have anything to meet with me about. I don't. I don't need to. Actually, I just wanted to to ask about that. Whether you wanted me to get started on the special permit, but I guess not. We'll wait no. until yeah, we hear wait from them and we hear from the public. Okay. That's all I was going to raise. Okay. Nope. So, so we, we, I'll make a motion to adjourn. If I can have a second. Second. All in favor. Aye. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Mary Lonky, enjoy. Yeah. This is the Bye. best chapter in your life. I'll tell you, it's the best one yet. Thank you. Enjoy every minute. Yes. Thank you all. You bet.